Tonight we're going to finish up reading through Paul's first letter to the church at Thessalonica. And uh, we're going to pick up a little bit. Last week we talked about the rapture and what our blessed hope, what we are expecting as Christians. Uh, and next, when we carry on, we're just going to go right into the second letter because it carries on the apocalyptic, the apocalyptic theme of Thessalonians. People don't normally think of that, these letters as that, but it is. Uh, his earliest letters that he wrote that were recorded in the Bible, and uh, they uh, per- portray a hope that they had. These Christians he was writing to had only been saved maybe months, just new Christians, but they had a fervent hope that Christ, Christ was going to return. They asked the question, what about the people who have died? Are they going to miss Jesus? And that's where Paul started talking about the resurrection of the dead and the rapture of the church. And I'm, I'm, uh, before we read this, I, the, this last section of uh, Thessalonians is kind of like a manifesto. You know, Jesus said to occupy until we come. And it, it, it's kind of like Paul giving these new Christians some marching orders, some, some uh, they're not suggestions, they're commandments to believers. And I was thinking how uh, he, he, he begins, um, just begin reading, um, let's, let's go back to verse uh, 6 uh, in, in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. I'm, I'm not sure what, where I put the first one I put up here, but uh, 5. Uh, 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 verse 6. Well, verse 5. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. We read this last week. But Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Spending our time here productively for the Lord. I, uh, I did a little bit of uh, Googling, okay? I was Googling. And uh, I, I, I came upon how we spend our time, okay, as, as uh, Americans. Uh, and I think these, this is particularly to Americans. Uh, the average lifespan is about 78 years. So we're all going to beat that in here. You know, we're going we're gonna to go over the average. That comes down to 683,280 hours. Okay, so I, I had a lot of time on my hands today. So in that time, we'll spend 25 years sleeping, 10.3 years working. Women will spend 17 years trying to lose weight. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you. It was on the Internet, so it got to be right, okay? Hey. <laughs> We spend 9.1 years watching TV. Some of us do. Two years watching commercials. 1.5 years cleaning. That don't apply to me. She makes up. (laughs) I don't hit 1.5. She just, you know, okay. (laughs) All right. 2.5 years cooking. 3.66 3.66 years eating, and I'm not going to make any comments about it. 4.3 years driving. 1.5 years in the bathroom. Okay. I heard, I heard on a commercial they call it the Oval Office, right? Okay. Uh, now check this out. Now this is, this is a newer statistic, okay. 70% of our waking life is spent in front of digital media. So how much time do we spend with the, you know, the cell phone or with a smartphone or in front of a computer screen? This is this is a newer this is a newer uh, statistic. You spend 14 days of your life kissing. Okay. <laughs> We will, on the average, uh, in, in our lifetime, laugh out loud 290,000 times. Some of us. Just a few more, and we're done. You'll drink 12,000 cups of coffee. Women spend nearly one year dis- deciding what to wear. Okay. And there were some, there were some other things on there, okay. 
But, you know, when you, when you count your hours of the day, how you spend your time, it's, if, we, if we measure that to how much time we spend doing the things, even thinking about God, okay, we think about God. I hope that we spend all our time, or most of it, waking hours thinking about the Lord, thinking about what he wants, uh, and, 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 and caring about our job as, as occupants here, occupying till he comes. Reading on a little bit more, back to like the good stuff, not the silly stuff, okay. He says, uh, verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. We read this. For they that sleep in the night, uh, they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet of hope, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So we're living together. We're going to live forever with him when he returns. We're going to live with him in glory, but we're living with him even right now. He's living with us. His spirit is inside of us. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do, encouraging one another, to be aware of and cognizant of the fact that we are Christians, we're called to occupy this planet until the blessed hope of the Lord. Now, in, starting in verse 12, we get these instructions from Paul, commandments. He says in verse 12, We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Man, if we ever needed to, to quicken this commandment to our hearts, you know, he was saying this to people who lived in a time when they didn't have, you know, they didn't have the uh, 200 channels and they didn't have all the, the media outlets. But yet there were those who would come around claiming to be apostles. And, and the New Testament is full of warnings about testing and checking out people that come and claim to be leaders, claim to be anointed, claim to be apostles. They might even have some fruits of that. They might even have some evidence. They might have some credentials of something. But he says, know them that labor among you. Uh, be sure that, you know, if, if people are standing up praying, you, you know, we, we like when we have prayer time, there are guys I call on to pray because I know them. Uh, we've had times before where people have come in and started laying hands on people, you know, that I didn't know. And it's, that's kind of that's scary sometimes because you don't know what spirit they're of. They might sound good. They might look good. They might, somebody might even tell you they're okay. But I kind of like to know the, the folks I got praying for people. Uh, I, I, I kind of like to know the folks that, that, you know, everybody has different gifts and different callings in, in the body of Christ, uh, f- from the ones who run, you know, do the sound to the ones that maybe sit down and, and show mercy to people, and counsel people, or talk. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I like to know who they are, even when we get together with the men on Monday nights. I know, I know Pastor Lovey, I know Brother Jerry, I know them guys. I know I can trust them. I'm not afraid to have them pray with somebody or minister to somebody because I know, where I know they're full of the Spirit. I know they're God's people. Paul admonishes these uh, Christians in Thessalonica, know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord. And to esteem them highly in love for their work's sake. This does not mean to exalt them, as we talked about this before, one of, the things that, one, of the, one of the things the early church after the apostolic age fell into was the ex- exaltation of, cl- of clergy. Uh, Nicolaitanism that Jesus talked about in, in the Revelation, where they began to see those people in ministry as being holy or being another level. Or being, it, it, that's not the case. It's a, it's a calling and it's a job that we're called to do and and, and hopefully in equipping and an anointing, but it doesn't make anybody enter any better than anybody else. But he says to honor those. If somebody teaches, if somebody does their work uh, and does it well, then you should esteem them highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. So this, uh, in any body, if somebody is a worker for the Lord, we should look upon them 
and, uh, and let them know we're thankful. You know, people tell me, they, they thank me for you know, being a pastor or whatever. You know, Pastor Harold, he always, he always says it pretty well. He says, if somebody gives you a compliment, chew it up a little bit and spit it out. You know, don't, don't uh, let it get, take root, because a lot of times people will let that happen. But it's important that the people that do a good job ought to be, say, hey, you know, you got to say, hey, you're doing a good job once in a while. Uh, okay, verse 14. Here we go now. When we come to discipline in the church, it, it would be nice if, if we were all like good little... Okay. But sometimes folks act up. We exhort you, brethren, in verse 14, warn them that are unruly. Sometimes people can get unruly. Sometimes they can't help it. You know. We've had to say a few things to a few folks. Some of you don't, don't, I'm sure most of you don't remember a fellow named Robert. Robert's passed away now. And Robert was seriously mentally ill. I mean, he was, um, yeah, there, there was a story behind that I don't want to go into it, but he was very seriously mentally ill. And uh, he, was, he was a nice guy. He was harmless, but he looked, he looked scary. Robert looked scary. And he had this habit. He used to live with Teresa. Some of you remember Teresa lived over in a uh, family house in Natrona. So I would pick Teresa and Robert up to go to church, and that was some pretty interesting car rides. And uh, what Robert would do was, and he couldn't help himself, and again, he, he, if, if, a, if a woman walked into church, and, it was, and she was like younger and looked nice, he'd go up to her and he'd say, hey, my name's Robert, I'm looking for Mrs. Wright. That's what he would say to her. But he would say, we would talk, I mean, I don't want to like, I'm not putting the guy down, he couldn't help himself. So I had to pull him aside and say, hey, Robert, at first I said, just say hello. First I just said that. I finally had to tell him, hey, Robert, don't talk to the women. <laughs> don't talk to any women. And he was cool with that. He was, he was all right. He was okay. Robert, he was all right with it. He wasn't. But sometimes you've got to address things like that. He says, warn them that are unruly. And, and most of the time, I have found out that most people do stuff like that. They don't really understand, especially if it's a mental thing. They don't really understand what they're doing. Now, there's, a, there's some that do, and there's sometimes you just have to say, hey, don't come, don't come here, you know, if you can't, and I've had to do that. If you can't, you know, not, uh, well, I'm not going to detail, but if, 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 and, and because there has to be some kind, we want to be friendly, we want to be open, we want to be free in the spirit, but you're always going to get somebody that's going to act up. Somebody's going to act up. So Paul says, Within the body, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble minded, like somebody like a Robert. He needed to be comforted, he couldn't help himself. If somebody does not have the mentality, you need to comfort them. They can't help themselves. Uh, Albert's dad used to call them God's little ones, ones who were. Comfort the feeble minded, support the weak. There are those who are weak, and I think that's not only speaking of weak in physically, but weak in the faith. Paul talks about that in his letter to the Romans. Those whose faith is shaky, for whatever reason, we need to support them. We need to gird them up. We need to edify them. We need to encourage them. Be patient <laughs> toward all there's just some folks it's hard to be patient with. Okay? Nobody in here. No, no, nobody's who's talking about me. I'm not. Okay. There's just some folks it's hard to be patient with. <laughs> I'm not going to tell any stories about them. Because, I, 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 Lord, you know, I said this prayer. I, I, I think I shared this with you before, probably did. When we first started, I said, Lord, send us the ones nobody else wants. Well, he did. <laughs> and there's a reason why nobody wants them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nobody in here. Now, don't anybody get the idea. I'm not talking about anybody here. 
But be patient. Be patient. Sometimes you've got to pray for patience, man. I just, sometimes you've got to say, Lord, and I'm, you know, I preached a message one time. You can love them, but it's, sometimes it's hard to like them. Loving and liking is two different things. I don't hate anybody. We're not supposed to hate no one. But there's some folks you just got to say, Lord, I need a little extra, extra measure of grace. Miss Jane knows what I'm talking about. She works down, <laughs> down on the street. You got folks coming in there. You know, and when you deal with those kind of people, that's what you're going to get. Well, that's what Jesus had. That's what Jesus dealt with that. So if Jesus had patience with folks, I guess we can too. Verse 15. These, these are just commandments for the body of Christ. This is how we're going to occupy. This is how we're going to exist together. You know, Brother Jerry, Monday night, he talked about getting along with one another. Sometimes a brother might say something that you don't like, or sometimes somebody might give you a cold shoulder for whatever reason. And you know, we've got to be careful that we just don't get offended. You know, sometimes it's not even directed toward us, but we see it that way. We need to pray, God, God, give me patience with my brother and my sister. Because if the Holy Spirit's in charge, there's nothing you can't work out. And you might not agree 100% on everything. Again, Albert's dad used to say, if two guys agree on everything, one of them ain't thinking. <laughs> I don't know if I can totally get with that, but it's true. You know, you're not going to agree about 100% on everything. Okay? It's okay. We're not talking about the major stuff, but we're talking about, you know, patient. God, give us patience toward all men. That's even folks outside the body. You need some patience out there. <laughs> I had to pray for patience today. I went to get my hair cut. Okay. So I went to Fantastic Sam's, right? So I'm sitting there, and they call my name. So I get up, and the girl says, okay, sit here. And there was a, there was a, a guy there. It was the cutest little thing. There was a guy there, and he had a son there. And... It was like the kid's first haircut, right? So the guy was sitting in the chair next to where his kid was telling the barber how he wanted the haircut. And the kid's like, the kid's kind of like tensed up, you know? <laughs> so, so the lady that was going to cut my hair, she went over to help, I guess it was a trainee or something. So I'm sitting in this chair and they ain't cut my hair. <laughs> so I'm sitting there thinking, so I said, Lord, so I was, I was good. I was good. I, I did. I was just sitting there nice. I, got, I was reading, I was reading uh, you know, my, my Kindle book on my phone, and everything was all right. And so I, I just, I, I didn't make any faces or nothing. I did good. Okay. And I got my hair cut. All right. Uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't know if he's coming for the haircut or the fact that I was good. All right. Okay. Verse 15. I'm going to make smoke come out of my ears. I, I, <laughs> I, showed, I, showed, I showed Sister Karen I, on my new laptop if I, it has a camera on it, and you can make smoke come out of your ears. <laughs> so anyway, okay, Karen like that. <laughs> All right. Okay, verse 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. Don't pay back our natural... Uh, response, our natural instinct, Ms. Jane said, our natural instinct, if somebody does us wrong, the first thing we want to do is get even in the natural. Don't do that. In the body of Christ. To any man. Not just in the body, but even outside. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. What's good? What's good? What's the right thing to do? Now we've got these little one-liners in here. Verse 16. Rejoice evermore. Rejoice. He's saying this to people who are getting persecuted. He's saying this to people who have become outcasts where they live because they've embraced Christ. The Jews come against them. The Romans are coming against them. He's saying rejoice. Joy is not happy. Happiness. That's not, they're not the same thing. You can be happy. That's when the happy happens when, 
when something good happens. You get happy. But rejoicing is whether it's good or bad. Paul and Silas rejoiced when they were in prison. So Paul knew what he was talking about. Pray without ceasing. Now, you know, if, if, this, if I applied this to the church I grew up in, I'd spend all my whole day saying, Our Father wrote in heaven, hell be. <laughs> came. But that's not what it is. Prayer is communication. We should have our line of communication with God open 24-7. Always ready to pray, always ready to listen, because prayer is a two-way street. It's not just speaking, not just telling God what we want Him to hear. Ask, telling Him what we think we need, or... But it's listening to what he's going to say. Because if we listen, he'll speak to us too. This prayer without ceasing is always have that open communication. Always have the ringer turned on. Because I need to talk to him every day. We can't, I can't shut him out. It's, it's a, our, this relationship thing is a 24-7 thing all the time. When nobody else is around me, he's there. I can talk to him. When I'm in the car, when nobody's around, they think I'm talking to myself. I might be praying. Pray without ceasing. And if we pray without ceasing, we'll be able to do this next one. In everything. Not necessarily for everything. Although there's another place in the Word that says pray, give thanks for everything. But in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. God, what's your will for my life? We need to live a life of gratitude. Constant gratitude. Thankful for everything. Even things we're not happy about. Even things that, are, that, that challenge us. Sister Cheryl said, Job said, he did not sin against God. In everything, give thanks. And I thank him for a bad diagnosis. I'm not thanking him for sickness, but I'm thanking him he's my God and he's given me a promise that no matter what happens, I'm going to go be with him. I'm thanking he's going to meet all my needs according to his riches and glory. I'm thankful. I've got to be thankful. Even, even if stuff around, even the circumstances don't warrant thanking him, I still got to be thankful in everything. That's God's will. It says over in Philippians, make your request known with thanksgiving. Before you see the answer. Sometimes it's hard. Thanksgiving is not a feeling. Sometimes you feel, man, I'm not thankful for this. You get jammed up. But it's not a feeling. It's an action like love. It's an action. Give thanks in everything. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. It's easy to do that. Especially, sometimes the Spirit does things that don't go with our agenda. Sometimes the Spirit will change the order of the church service. And just like that movie, it said, well, we never did it like that. Sometimes the Spirit wants to do something different. It's going to be according to God's Word. If the Spirit wants to move, I don't want to quench Him. I want Him to move. I want it to be according to God's Word. According to what Paul set up, he he told us how the Spirit's supposed to move in the congregation. I want it to be according to God's Word. Because I've seen enough where there were some spirits that needed to be quenched. It wasn't the holy ones. I want to quench the evil spirit, but I, don't, I sure don't want to quench the holy one. God, that's why we pray for, when we pray without ceasing, we say, God, give us discernment. We know those that labor among us, because I know the ones that's going to stand up and give a word. I know them. I, 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 I know where they're getting it from. Some stranger coming in and start giving some kind of word. I don't know who he is. She is. So all these going together. Everything we're going to occupy till he comes back. We're doing it according to his word. We hear from the Spirit. 
We don't want to quench the Spirit. We want to allow the Spirit to move. Verse 20, despise not prophesying. There's some folks, some places, where somebody stood up and started speaking in another language, they would escort them out the door. <laughs> there are. There's folks teaching against it. I want to hear from God. I want God to be here. I want God to speak. If God's going to speak through somebody, and I know who it is, and I can trust them, and I know it's, it's, it's the word of God, I want to hear his voice. If God doesn't show up, what are we doing here? I want God to show up. Prove all things. That means try all things. It, that word prove, it's used in the New Testament a lot. It's, it refers to what they would do if they had gold or silver and they wanted to see how pure it was. They heat it up and they take all the garbage out of it and then it would be uh, the, more, the more heat that would, they would, would apply to it, the more of the dross that would come out. So they want to prove it. They want to test it to make sure it's, it's pure. Uh, I believe the word is assay. They would assay gold to see how, how pure it was. We need to, when a word is given, when, when a, somebody stands up here and preaches, we, those of us who, you know, not everybody. Now, he's, he's speaking this to new Christians, okay? But by the, 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 the ministry of the Spirit in us, we need, especially those of us who know the word, we need to listen. And we need to, not just to nitpick or find an error, but I believe that if somebody come up here and say something wrong, the Holy Spirit would send up a bunch of red lights, some folks might not hear, but I know there's some folks in here. If somebody come in here and say something that wasn't right, man, it would be like the buzzer would go off. That's why we need to prove all things. The stuff that we watch on TV, the stuff that we listen to, when you know religious teaching, we need to prove it, test it, see who the, the person is giving it, find out who they are. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearances of evil. The appearance of evil. We, we've, we've kind of thrown that to the wind in the body of Christ in general. We've thrown that to the wind. I will not give a woman a ride in my car unless I have somebody else with me. A young woman. Miss Jane, Miss Lil, yeah, okay, no, no problem. <laughs> no problem. Patty, you know, Patty V, you know, Karen, yeah, that's no problem. I remember Pastor Spencer told the story one time. He has a niece named uh, Wani, Juanita. And she's blind. And he picked her up one time to take her to church. And somebody came up to him and says, they didn't know him, they says, Hey, man, Pastor, I've seen you with that woman in your car. <laughs> this is niece. I won't do it. Why? Because, you know... I'm, because I don't, that's an appearance. Somebody see, there's a pastor, especially if, <laughs> no. I've had people call me for rides that, that, that did not have a good reputation. <laughs> Could you give me a ride? No. There's that pastor driving around with. It's an, it's an appearance of view. It might be perfectly innocent. As a matter of fact, it might be an, it might be an act of mercy, an act of uh, uh, you know, uh, providing for somebody who has a need, but it's an appearance of evil. And unless it's like life or death, I mean, I'll call somebody to go along with me. I'll call Elber, I'll call somebody, hey, let's go for a ride, so-and-so needs, because I want, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. It's an appearance of evil. You could, you could plug in whatever situations you're in. There's some things that we just got to say, no, I can't. Because 
It's an appearance. Now, if somebody is dying, you know, there's, there's exceptions. Just like, you know, we think, think about the guy in the, in the, uh, the Good Samaritan, where the guy was lying, lying on the side of the road dying, and people just walked past him. There's, there's, there's always exceptions to every rule. But generally, I won't do it. Because it looks evil, okay? And he says this. If we do these things, he says, as, as we live, as we occupy, and follow these commands that's given to the body of Christ, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, set you apart completely. If you follow after this, if you follow this manifesto of occupation, if you do this, then, then God, the, the God of peace, will set you apart. He'll make you holy completely. And I pray, God, that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep us, our spirit, our soul, and even our body. He'll keep us blameless until that time when the trumpet sounds. I often tell folks, this is one of those passages of Scripture I go to all the time. When we talk about who we are, why, why people say, you know, where, where can you see the Trinity? Man, that word Trinity is in the Bible. I'll tell you what, if you want to see a picture of the Trinity, go look in a mirror. Because the only thing that God created in His image is us. I've said this before, my, my, my cat has a body and a personality, has a life. If you ever had an animal, you know, they have, they have a, they, they're individual. But one thing that cat doesn't have, it doesn't have a spirit. It has a soul, that's like the life that's in it, that's who it is. It's, you know, it's, it's mentality. But it doesn't have a spirit. It knows nothing, a little spooky, knows nothing about dying. She doesn't, she knows nothing about afterlife. She knows nothing, she's not equipped for that. But human beings were made in the image of God. We were made body, soul, and spirit. And we're going to live forever, body, soul, and spirit. The resurrected body that we just read about it last week. We're going to live forever somewhere in the body. Forever, I'm going to be body, soul, and spirit. Now, if I die before the rapture, my body's going to lay... Lay down for a little while, but my, my soul and my spirit will go to be with the Lord. But when that trump sounds, I'm going to be reunited. We'll always be the image of God. Body, soul, and spirit. Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay? The very God of peace will sanctify you, set you apart. Completely, holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calls you. Do you believe that he's faithful? Sometimes we find ourselves faithless. You ever find yourself faithless? You know, you believe in God and trust in the Lord, but sometimes things happen. Again, we go back. It was a good message. If you haven't heard it, listen to it. I have it posted on Facebook about, you know, Job. Man, he, he was looking around and wondering what was going on. But he still said, I know my Redeemer lives. I mean, he, he didn't understand everything. And, and at the very end of that thing, he had to repent. He told the Lord, he said, well, you know, I heard about you, but now I know you. God said, where were you when I created everything? You got to straighten out. There's some times when we're faithless, but God's always faithful. And there's some times that we can't even imagine. Sometimes we get so drained, you get so wrung out. Come on, you know, right now there are people, again, we're praying for folks, they're going through stuff they don't understand. Doctors can't figure out what's going on. It's like there's, a, there's an onslaught on the health of people, and, and they, they don't understand. But you know what? God is still faithful. If he called you, 
If you're saved, you might not even feel like you're saved, but if you can point to the time when you got born again, if you have that testimony, I know I, know I believed in him. I know, when I, I know when he came into my life. I can remember that. He will do it. He'll do it. Whatever you need him to do, and I'm not talking about stuff. Whatever, whatever, you, whatever you need to accomplish in your life, in your heart, in your body, soul, and spirit, God will do it. Sarah waited till she was 89 years old. He told Abraham, you're going to have a son. Abraham tried to help him out. God said, that's not the one I gave you. That Ishmael, he's not the one I gave you. I'll bless him, but he's not the one I gave you. God was faithful. He'll do it in his time. I don't know if it's going to take 99 years. It's, I can't. But if God says it, he's going to do it. If God saved you, he's going to complete the work. Even if we stray, even if we lose our faith, even if we get broken, if we, get, if we feel like, you know, he's faithful. And that's the way we're going to leave this letter. Paul said, brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. But we're going to leave this with this verse 24. Faithful is he that calls you, who will also do it. He'll complete the work that he started. The work he started in you. He's not going to, he's not going to dump you. He's not going to give up. He's not going to change his mind and say, well, I'm, he's not going to reject you. You, you read this passage where he said, pray without ceasing, everything, give thanks. You, you, you do that? I'm trying to. And he's going to finish what he said he's going to do. And ultimately, the blessed hope, we're going to die and go to heaven. We can, I mean, I don't like to think about dying, but on, this, on, on, on the other hand, It's going to happen. That's our hope. In the meantime, we need to occupy while we're here. Next week, we'll start into the next one, the next letter, where Paul gets a little more specific about the things that's coming up, the things that's going to happen. Anybody have any questions or comments tonight? Anybody here feel like... Man, I, I just need some prayer tonight because I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I'm wrung out. Sometimes I feel like I, maybe I spent my last, my last chance or I lived my ninth life with the Lord. Let's pray.